Welcome back to the It's Just Boar podcast, a league of our own. I'm Joanna Reardon. I'm Neve, and today we have Phil Healy with us. We are very excited to dive into some of the European indoors. Tell us all about the experience. So thanks a million for having me on the podcast um, and I'm delighted to be a part of it for uh, this week. But European indoors was unbelievable. It was a great experience and especially the times that we're in, like we were very fortunate to have a major championship during a pandemic. All that, like it was a different one to, to normal, but we got the opportunity to compete and that's what any athlete is um, looking for. Um, it was an absolute high for me coming fourth um, in the final with my first Major senior final. Um, I know some people will be disappointed with fourth, but um, I walked away with a PB. So it was the quickest time I've ever run. Um, and it was my third race in 36 hours. And some people underestimate the what it takes to come out and do three races in 36 hours and just the pressure that there is going through the rounds. And championship racing is certainly different to a normal one-off racing on the circuit. So, um, no, I'm thrilled to with my performance and I'm looking forward to taking it into the summer for a massive year ahead. We were kind of curious because I remember on um, the Shine Festival you were telling me about the difference between indoors and outdoors. Like, and you were saying that like it can get a little bit scrappy. Like, can you talk to us like a little bit about like you know your like your mentality, like your your preferences maybe, and like how your mindset would change like on outdoors and indoors. Hundred percent, and I think everyone watching at the weekend saw um, the excitement and the entertainment that um, running indoors brings in comparison to outdoors with with people cutting in after 100 meters, 150 metres in the 400, but you just have to take it round by round. Like in the heat, I knew who I had and I knew I had raced a Swiss girl um, outside me before and I knew how she races. The semi-final is a whole different load of competitors and you have to reassess again and like you have different tactics and then the final, anything can happen. So you do, every race is going to be different. There's no way you can like go in with the same plan in every single race and you definitely have to like act on your feet and react as well um and as we saw in the final um there were so many speed-based athletes so we were all coming to the bell together and there was definitely a clash um amongst everyone and you had to check your stride but um it's the entertainment certainly outdoors when you have a lane on your own it's a lot more freedom a lot more free thinking um but look it's it's exciting and um you just have to be in the zone you have to run your own race, but at the same time, you're very conscious of who else is around you. So you just have to act on your feet, really, to, to sum it up. I think it's definitely exciting. Like, there is just so much going on over the weekend in relation to the racing and that. Um, how, do, how does everybody avoid, like, kicking each other and all that kind of stuff? Like, so I just watched, I was like, whoa, those feet are so close. Like, <laughs> It is crazy. And even just watching back, you're like, oh, my God, how did I not get clipped by someone? But, like... I've had my uh, nightmares of indoors, like even 26, 2019, uh, so that would have been the last European indoors. Um, I was in the semi-final and a girl kicked me from behind and she fell, but she totally knocked me off. Um, in 2017, we all clashed at the bell and the girl in front of me fell and she fell into the speaker that was at the side of the track. But, um, <laughs> but like, it is such a close game and like even... I was looking back at um, when I raced at the micro meet in Dublin about three weeks ago, I was nearly clipped there again. So like it's such fine margins and anything can go wrong, but it's like, it's an exciting factor as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. just thinking about like Achilles. I'm like, oh God, if someone steps, like that's my nightmare. Like as someone who clearly does not have an Achilles, um, I was just like, oh my God, like they're all just like bunched on top of each other. Something's going to happen. It's going to be a bloodbath. But then I was like, well, I like the bloodbath anyways, because it was exciting. Yeah. Like people throwing each other off the board. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, this is so entertaining to watch. And even for the longer events, like 800, 1500, um, etc. Like it just the pushing and shoving and people like pulling each other's singlets and different things like that. And um, like there was a lot of disqualifications because people were like stepping off the railing um, on the inside because they were pushed and shoved. But like, it's exciting for people to watch. It certainly isn't as exciting for the athletes in the process. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it is madness. And just how tactics come into play even in the longer runs and like, you might have to run wide and then that costs you and you can't push too much to get ahead of everybody else because you don't want it to be stop and start either. So um, there is a fine line with the whole thing and it's the joys of championship racing, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely very exciting. And as you're saying, like, you know, fourth, some people are, you know, 
almost disappointed for you but from your perspective like it's a massive thing to get into the final like you're saying like 2019 was the semi-final so I think it's incredible to to have that and, and really have it under your belt but how many times have you watched the final back I've actually only watched it I'd say about twice but like it is like it's a massive achievement to me to get to the semi final or to get to the final because I didn't want to be that like serial semi finalist and I saw an article mm-hmm. for um the final of like Phil Healy's the race of her life to um to be in contention and I was like you know what I'm sick of people doubting me all the ways along like I will produce the race of my life and I will go out there and I will die fighting because you do when you come to the final like you would think that there is more pressure but there's actually less pressure because navigating through the rounds there's obviously that pressure of I need to qualify I need to make it through but when you're in the final it's like a one-off race on the circuit Mm -hmm. again like it's just it's just wide open and we knew that the Dutch girls were favourite from one and two because they were always um, leading the way in Europe all season long. But one of the Dutch girls was actually fifth place. So to get a scan mm. of her as well was like a massive bonus for me. But yeah, I just walked off the track happy. Like I knew it was going to be a quick time based on the time that won. And it did take a while for the times to come up. But to see PB written next to it after when it came up on the board and I was just in my element to just even just get back through even though I was ready to fall like poor David Gillick had to <laughs> the RD interview three times but <laughs> um but no it like I gave it my all and like I did get sick everywhere after and like going through the media zone they did have to give me um a black bag in case I did get a sick again but it's just a whole different experience of like even having to wear the masks and all the media and how like you're used you're used to having like an RD reporter trackside everything was through like a, a virtual camera like um so it was different in that way but I think it'll definitely give us that experience and like a trial run for what's to come yeah. like, did you that way for a while did you get a picture with the toast because that's like I mean it was the most distracting <laughs> with the toast I don't even know if it was toast but it looked like a toast like the little mascot in the corner like I saw him like walk over to you like after you were done I was like if she gets a picture with the toast this is my life <laughs> No, there's actually a video, um, Shane, my coach, put it on Twitter of, like, when we were coming out for the final, I actually ran away from the toast. Well. <laughs> um, yeah. so I saw that. Yeah, um, but that poor toast or gingerbread or whatever he was, um, <laughs> gave poor sports, um, sports file, um, Sam Barnes, a hard time because he was always in the way. Um, but any, like, once you cross the line, all you can see is the toast like he was everywhere um, straight away but um, no I got no picture but I did run away <laughs> yeah no the um going on from like the personal best and everything like that's it's like a, a brilliant time to achieve and you are second on the all-time list indoors but that time has actually moved you to third on the all-time outdoor list as well which we can potentially expect an even quicker run when it gets to outdoors. Are, are you looking forward to heading into that outdoor season? A hundred percent. And even like the, looking at the 200 splits like we went through in 23.8, which is by far my quickest split that I've ever done and to do with that on my third race. So like when I came back out after the race, I texted Shane and I was like, when is my next 200 going to be? Because I'm really <laughs> excited to uh, to do a 200. But no, especially as well for the 400, because it was messy, that race, that final like I ran the second lap in lane two. Um, I ran the last 50 meters in lane four. So I mm-hmm. certainly gave myself extra work, but that's what you have to do in a championship final. So um, outdoors, when you have your own lane, um, you can focus on what you're doing yourself. Uh, I'm certainly excited and uh, hopefully give a shot as well to qualifying for it in Tokyo because the weekend sets us up nicely in terms of ranking points. So um Qualifying in two events is certainly something that's achievable and I will definitely give it a, a shot. Yeah, like, I mean, like, overall, like, you know, I, like, remember on Twitter, you were saying, like, you know, you're a coach, you know, you want to give a thanks to them. And I remember the last time we spoke, you were talking about sports psych and kind of different things like that have helped you. Like, what, like, not to ask, like, a dumb question, but, like, what impact has all of that, like, overall had on you? Especially, as you said, like, you know, articles were coming out saying, you know, you were a serial semifinalist, you had to do, like, an extraordinary race to, like, get anywhere. So, like, how are you better, like, equipped to cope with the, the stuff that's kind of out there now? Yeah, like even you could see with the the young team, like some people got affected a lot more. And I think my whole support team around me, like Shane is the leader, but 
everyone brings their own piece to make the jigsaw. Do you know when you need all the mm. elements? It's not just the coach. It's the psychology. It's the nutrition. It's the uh, physiology. And it's the physio. Everyone works together. Um, and it's so important to connect everybody together. And like even after each of the rounds, I would have been talking to Dick here, my psychologist. And she certainly like brought me back down again, like not to get carried away of like, I have to navigate my way through the rounds and not just like think it's job mm-hmm. done at the, in the heat. And that's something that I would have learned along the way as well. Just different coping mechanisms and um, learning to what to block out and what to, to keep in. And I certainly would like I wouldn't give time sometimes to, to those articles or a lot of noise that can be created around major championships or, oh, she's a medal hope and she's this and she's that. Because you can let all of that pressure take like advantage of like just get the better of yourself as such but you just need to rise above it and you need to block it out at times like and there was days mm-hmm. where like I fully logged out of social media and different things like that because it can be there's always extra attention when it comes to like a major championship so people can get caught up in it and get caught up yeah. in it on the wrong way while your competitors could be off and be like 100% focused so um yeah. it definitely the whole jigsaw of people um together and certainly Shane and even Kira together certainly won't let me get carried away um and bring me back down to reality so like there's no (laughs) there's no me flying off my own world no it can definitely be overwhelming and I I, I know you've obviously been in in the game for a while so you kind of get used to it and and I think like there's things that you can use and then things that you can kind of be distracted by um I think from our perspective we we were looking at how are people getting through the rains and thought that if you were if you're in the final that anything could happen there so um it's it's definitely like you're talking about the championship racing I think it's really in like important for people to kind of understand that because I know there was talk of kind of seed times and everything across all the events of where people might come but those times don't matter if you can't get through the rains to to even compete in the final a hundred percent and the only bonus of having a quick time before going into a major championship is in terms of seeding and for me it was lane draw in terms of an 800 1500 athlete it's how they're seeded in like who they're drawn against um but when it comes to you step on that line ta- like the times go out the window and everyone is a clean slate mm-hmm. like you like across all the events you saw how many people produced um different pbs and things like that so like you will have the the couch commentators and the people looking in and saying like oh i was ranked number five in europe or um, that means that I should be in the final and should be in the top mm-hmm. six and I was ranked the top five in Europe in 2019 as well but that doesn't mean I'm automatically in the final so mm-hmm. anything can happen and rankings go out of the window once you tow that line and it is about navigating through the rounds because every mm-hmm. race is going to be different like um, and then it's who you're drawn against in your semi-final some people get lucky some people um, get a harsh draw but it all comes down to where you place and what your time is in placing um so it definitely brings its own challenges once you come into the major championship but you definitely need that quick time um which helps you mm-hmm. in terms of seeding going into uh, the championship yeah like you're no stranger to like incredibly exciting 400 meter races and i know we briefly kind of talked about it before and you were telling me about nfl teams using your race as motivation um you you know that really and obviously 2018 where you know michelle Finn obviously took a storm and you were repping ucc um how like can you talk a little bit i know you, you've told me personally but can you tell like our listeners basically like how that all came about and like how you were selected and like what you were thinking throughout that entire race and like was it as crazy for you as it was for us watching like yeah and that was back in 2016 when I was still in UCC and representing the college and I had raced the 100 and 200 that weekend so I had done four races between the heat and the final and then it was time to to come to the relay and my coach wanted me to like just dip the toe into the 400 but do it in a relay because you're kind of hidden and there's no expectations and different things like mm-hmm. that. So I was asking the um, UCC crew, could I be put onto the relay? Um, and they put me on. And it was kind of like, okay, let's go in under the radar. Let's cover the distance and see how I fare. Um, and possibly maybe move to 400 down the line. But obviously under the radar sec- certainly didn't go to plan. Um, <laughs> but like, like even just in the race, like it's even a blur and like, 
relays are definitely easier as well if there's someone ahead of you but when I had gone in and I hadn't done the 400 work I had no clue what to expect and I was like okay I'm going to go to get to 200 and I'm going to completely blow up but um I was just reeling in the people closer and closer and I felt really good and then with about 120 to go I had a kick and the there were so many people like out on the side of the track and like it was the last event of the the two-day event and so it all comes down to points and getting points for your college. So um, the place was, there was a great atmosphere and everyone was shouting. So that just carried me to the line. But I certainly did not expect the uh, the reaction of it after. Like, and it went everywhere. I think it had like 48 million views on Good Morning America on some Facebook video. And like, it was shown across all America, YouTube, like yeah. every country. Like, the, it was just mental. And then people sending me videos uh, or sending me messages saying like, this gave me the motivation to get up and put uh, windscreen wipers on my car and um, teams watching it before games. And even still to this day, it resurfaces. And like someone might send a message saying that we watched it and there was a big um, NFL team in um, America. And it was actually a, a girlfriend of one of the players messaged me um, to say that they had watched it and um, how inspirational it was and what they could take from it. So, but like for me, it just represents like, just give it your all, like never give yeah. up, it's never over till the, till the, once you cross that line, but you can carry that into so many aspects of life and like, just, just never give up and just give all you have because I could have just sat back, um, if I wanted it and taken that fifth place where I took off, but, um, I think, yeah, people can take so much, it's not just the sporting element, people take so much of their, um, their own ways and what they can take from it, but, uh, for me, I give 110% to everything that I do, whether it is the sporting side of things, whether it's academic side of things. Um, and you don't have to be the best. Like, once you give it your all and don't give up, then that's what people can take from it. As, like, yeah. Phil would know, like, in Cork, there's huge, like, West Cork versus Duhallow rivalry. So, like, as a UCC person, I was, like, rooting for, for, for Phil. And then as a Duhallow person, I was like, oh, no. Like, Michelle. <laughs> Especially from a West Cork perspective. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because I like West Cork, I think we're like a county of our own with uh, everything that we have down there. And once we get that border from uh, Cork City down, uh, but no, it's great to see as well the talent that is yeah. in West Cork across female sports no. and male sports and what they're doing. No, it's such an exciting race and I think we'll we'll share it so people can have a look if they haven't seen it already. But it certainly looked like Michelle kind of was was reeling in people and then you just fly out of nowhere and she look you're a, a, an internet sensation as well as as killing it on the track. Yeah. It was all a bit mad. And he was seeing Michelle like after she was like, Oh my god, if I see that video once more or who else makes a comment. <laughs> Oh, Talk to us uh, about a little bit what's going on in sprinting at the moment, because obviously, so you have your 100 record, your 200 record, you've said 300 indoors, but there's a few of the girls are, are banging on the doors and they're, they're really trying to put you under some pressure. A hundred percent, and it's great to see, and like, as such, like, for me, yes, I have those records, but for me, I always want to do better as well, mm -hmm. and like, 1140 was the... um. 100 record and that stood since like 2008 or something like that and the 200 record was 17 years old so like it's now a new marker like mm -hmm. you need to be in the seven threes the seven twos to be making like the european semi-finals um and different things like that so we've got everybody to up their game as well mm -hmm. like constantly like every country is improving and then if we just look closely at home if we have the same standard all the time obviously every nothing is going to improve but like yeah. um everyone has upped their game and there's so many more people that have produced PB since and got closer to that time. Like I think, um, so I have 1128, I think Kieran Evan has an 113. So it's, it's really close to that record and records are there to be broken. Like I'm not going to hold those records, um, all the time. And like, even across the 200 and 400, like in America at the moment, you see Devisha and, uh, Rashida absolutely storming mm -hmm. it over there. And like, um, Rashida breaking the junior record. And like, again, being so close to she's like on that world class stage like that would have been a standard for um European indoors and like she is like so well able and just shows that people have stepped up people are changing events people are finding out a lot more and I think it comes down to the coaches and like needing to to network and like even I look at my coach Shane um he's in touch with so many different coaches across so many different countries um and you need to have those 
connections because one coach will know something that you don't know and they've made the mistakes it's going to help you and mm. people are actually willing to help each other and you think oh you're competitors but in the day they're there to help each other and one person is going to take something from it and the other person is going to take something else but um it's so important for coaches to learn and I think in Ireland as well people are just stuck in their ways sometimes and like repeat the same thing over and over and it's not just athletics it's across all sports yeah and ego becomes into play as well and like they they don't want to learn but it's like it's getting to the next step it's unlocking the new doors like it's end of the day it'll give you a performance and it'll give you new information and you can everyone is different like I even look at my training group and one thing works for for me and something completely different works for something somebody else Mm -hmm. like you will take so many different things that you can apply to so many different people in different ways and I think that needs to progress across all sports and like even the connection and like you see an awful lot of more GA are now realizing the importance of speed into a GA game and like even Shane my coaches coach with them the the tip hurlers but like it is so important to make that connection like you need to be fast you need to be fit you need to have all the elements and like coaches need to just connect across all sports Mm -hmm. to learn and uh, have that like that unit to be overall better to get that performance yeah yeah. Like you mentioned, you know, how everyone is like connected and interconnected, like you've trained. I remember we were talking about some of the temporary ladies footballers and, and kind of different like that, different things like that. Like what? Obviously, they learn kind of stuff from you in terms of like speed and fitness and, and how to kind of get off the blocks quickly and things like that. What are you like taking from them? You know, like, is there anything that you feel you've learned from from being with these girls and training with them? Maybe you're like, no, no, a hundred percent. Like they're coming from a. Um, a team sport and there I have the individual element so it's so important to see the two sides of things and like um, we had some of the tip um, female um, uh, footballers come down Sarah Rowe was down another time and um, Alison Miller who was former Irish rugby player was down a good bit with us and like she's someone that I took so she would have I would have had the most contact with her for Mm -hmm. someone coming in from the outside um and like it's just to see their mentality how what they deal with and like even one thing Alison always told me was be better not bitter and like you just have to be like there's no point in like wallowing over something or like she was making the comparisons of like the male rugby team in comparison to what the females got and she said she could like good on a full round all the time of, and like be mm-hmm. bitter over what they get in comparison to the women but like sometimes you just have to suck it up and write your own story and uh, um just work hard in silence and like create your own performance because there's no point in like creating a big fuss and getting carried away with it with this when you as the athlete have to like get down to work and just make the performance happen well we were going to ask what you think the, the different opportunities for women and men are in sport but I think you've given us the piece of advice there on that no but like even it, when it comes to athletics obviously we competed the same the same day same mm-hmm. time so we don't see it as much but like you like 100 percent. like athletics is a minority sport we're not the household names of like ga rugby soccer who get the coverage all the time on television so i think it is so important that even from a brand perspective like i was really lucky to get a sponsored car um this season and like that rarely happens in female sport like mm-hmm. it's always the the male athlete that gets it um because they're the the headline name they're the ones that are on the front of the paper all the time and I remember this time last year I did um a talk for um a business in um for uh, international women's day and I was looking it was in um West Cork and I was just looking at the the front page of the sports paper so I was looking at a major um headline paper and then I was looking at our um West Cork and Southern Star and like for I looked at six weeks in a row and there was six weeks of the main headline paper. There wasn't one girl on the front page. And then there was at least one girl every single week on the front page of the local paper. So it comes down to media as well. Like media are the big mm. media are the controllers of the whole thing. And if they're not yeah. giving the time, how are the kids growing up going to know these household names? How are they going to get to know um the next stars coming up in athletics, coming up in football? But women's football, kamogi, rugby, like you're not going to know. It's like at the moment it's down to like um, platforms like yourself or parents and like the likes of, say, Jackie Hurley's book or the 42.ie mm-hmm. uh, colouring book. But 
we all know like when we were younger we watched television that's where you see it that mm-hmm. like I always remember the standout cork um hurlers and footballers on the male side of things but like I didn't know the female people growing up because you're not exposed to it so it doesn't become our like our norm of watching it so um it is like again I could be bitter about the whole thing and in terms of like even when you come to looking at sponsorships and different things like that mm. there is a massive uh, inequality in terms of males over females sometimes but again I'm really lucky to have Sinead Galvin um, mm-hmm. look after me and like she pushes us so much um, in terms of coverage in terms of support getting different um, deals over the line for us and like having that female there um, is massive to to push all of our team both male and female mm-hmm. and push a minority a minority sport to be up there with the the big household names of the the popular sports is it like really like not annoying but is it like a sort of hindrance really because you have kind of two things that you have to deal with like you have the fact one you want to obviously compete at a high level and you want to be breaking records and winning medals and doing whatever but at the same time you have to play this like flip role of where you have to be kind of out there for women in sports you know you have to make yourself accessible you know I'm not saying it like interferes with training and things like that but even if it is kind of like at a cost Neva's laughing at me I'm not saying she took time out of training for us Neva <laughs> um, yeah. but you know, like, overall like you know like is it like sometimes a bit of a like a hindrance that like the men's team kind of wouldn't have because they're so protected by like bubbles and PR groups and different things like that they are yeah but like for me say even if a child sends me a message and like you're going to make their day by replying and I'm like oh my god mm-hmm. this poor child is sending me a message and I don't see them I don't see myself as what they see you know yeah um, or being like this um role model or inspiration and even just at the weekend the amount of messages that I got um from people um like as a kid growing up I always remember who didn't sign an autograph for me and that sticks with any child so like why not give the child the time why not give anybody the time to just reply um Mm -hmm. because I'm not no privileged person that I can give the time to to them to make a difference their life and like that might be the reason they might stay in the sport or may not stay in the sport or like just different things but um yeah it depends as well on your support team around me like I am really lucky um Mm -hmm. and Sinead takes after everything in the in the Galvin sports management side of things but um and then Shane my coach looks after all the track side of things so I am protected in a way with the people (laughs) that are um like around me but you have to be that ambassador in sport and like even I look at the career side of things and I'm doing a career in IT and I see the massive inequalities there as well like and it's just it's just perceptions and what people think and people think going into IT that you have to be this really geeky person and you're like you're hood up in the corner and you're an absolute (laughs) like just whisk it all the time but that's totally not it and like I started off in nursing and like it would have been like 90% 90% female and you're like oh my god why is there a guy in our class and then you go to the computer <laughs> side and it's like 90% men it's like oh why is there a girl in our class but like for me I am an ambassador in the women in IT side of things as well because I want to educate the the kids coming up that it's not what they think it is it's not like all mm-hmm. coding and like um just like stuck at a computer all day but there is just so many elements of it so you have to be like visible to people as well and like Mm -hmm. women in sport they're doing a massive um job for it and it like all we need is that extra missing piece of like the funding and the the media more of the media um like support yeah no I think definitely um I I think people like what you're saying will remember the people that didn't sign autographs or didn't get back to you but they also will remember the people that did so like you're saying like you are impacting you know, children's lives and, and, and older people as well, you know, they'd be delighted to, to get a message back. But um, yeah, I think in relation to like the media coverage side of things and the sponsorship, like it all plays in together and you totally can be consumed by it as an athlete. But perhaps in, in your later years when you're, from, you know, maybe retired that it's something because I think it's, it's something that you obviously know a lot about and have experienced and stuff. I think you need to focus on what you're doing and, and try, uh, let other people try it and push the boundaries at the moment. But um. Yeah, definitely like 6% of the media coverage at the moment goes to women in sport, which is just, it's just not good enough. And the results are there. Like, look, we've looked at it ourselves and, and we know that the, the female athletes are performing massively. Um, the next few years for athletics, I think, is is going to be huge. But um, going back to the, the role models piece and that, like who were your role models growing up then? 
So definitely, like I always looked at the likes of Sonia, Rob, mm -hmm. Derva. But for me, Ailish Maxweeney was always someone that stood out for me. So she had the 100 meter record before um, before I did. And like I came onto the senior um, team when I was in leaving cert. And we had um, European team championships and they were actually held in um, Dublin that year. So that was my senior like debut as such. Um, but she took me completely under her wing that weekend. And like for me, it was a massive team. It was daunting. It was my first like senior international. Um, but it was a massive, massive experience. And like she was always that person that I could reach out to at any point and even like in athletics it's up and down like it's not like I'm going to get better year after year after year mm -hmm. I've had many downs in between and like um she was a great support to me and any question that I had she answered and she was there to, to help me so that is something that I will always remember and the support that she was so like she is definitely a standout um for me the the whole ways up are you like mother hen now, like in return to like all the, the young bucks kind of coming up? Like, you know, you, you obviously trade with Molly, you know, you got Kieran Neville as well. You know, like, are you are you now like replicating what Elish kind of did to you, like in a weird way? And also, like, I don't make, <laughs> like mean to like make you sound very old the way I phrase yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the new um, group of athletes coming through are, are so young and like, I'm just 26, but like, they're like coming into the, the make or break years of their career as well. But like, um the sport is hard enough so I don't get why people don't help each other sometimes you know like it's yeah. it's an individual sport I've made plenty of mistakes I've gone through injuries I've had different battles and whatever and like even say when Sarah Lavin um injured her ankle last year and like that could have been like like a, it was a massive um injury for her and like she reached out <laughs> to us for different things that we did when I broke my foot so I had the learning mm -hmm. experience that I could transfer to her um what like I would certainly offer people advice and especially like younger kids um as well even when they're like 17 18 that they might send me a message or whatever or like someone sent me a message last week of how do I balance um leaving cert and sport and like it was just a simple message back and I found that time it gave me great discipline and great organization skills just to have both and just one distract from the other um, and I do think it is so important for people to have that balance and have that distraction because obviously the books are high pressure um, and it's just a, an escape for like mm -hmm. mentally feeling better and physically feeling better but yeah like if someone asks me for help, I will give the help. Um, and yes, we are competitors at the end of the day, but I certainly help people um, far more than like nearly, like I, they are a competitor and I've given them mm -hmm. an awful lot more than say another competitor may not have given. Yeah. In relation to kind of the the advice, you're obviously you're obviously helping people along the way. And I think, you know, we're we're really looking at this piece of, you know, by the age 14, twice as many girls are dropping out of sport as boys. Um, some of the issues that kind of come up in relation to um, dropout rates, I mean, for, for you, like what are the things that you've seen? Like social media is a massive thing now. And I think like when I was back at that age, like there was like, it makes me sound so old, but like there was lots <laughs> of things like Wi-Fi and all this kind of thing, like Instagram, Snapchat, everything. But like, um, it's definitely social media and people are like, oh, she posted this picture and she posted that picture and look how she looks in this picture. And like mm -hmm. body image for everybody now. And like, even when you're in athletics, you have to like, the done thing is wear a crop top and a pair of knicker shorts mm -hmm. and some people may not feel comfortable in that and then when they don't wear it they're kind of like almost standing out for different for not for, yeah for being different and um, but I think people just need to like do this like when I was younger my coach said to me maybe athletics is not the sport for me so if I listened to that I wouldn't have achieved what I would have at this stage so like people need to like focus and especially girls at that age need to focus on what they enjoy and if they enjoy athletics or if they enjoy whatever it may be whether it may not even be sport but like do it for you and like don't be influenced because your friends are off doing like the the normal things of um, playing kamoe football or whatever if it's something that you want to do do it for you and like it's again in Ireland, everything is judged off, like, did you win a medal or that's how success is measured. But, like, you don't have to be the fastest. You don't have to be the best at everything. If you have given it your best, then you're winning for yourself. So, like, people need to move away from the mental winning mentality in both the boys and the girls. And, like, 
if you haven't given it your best, then the next day is another opportunity to do that. So um, that is certainly something that can help people from dropping out. And then if the support systems are there in clubs, like I was really fortunate in Bandon Athletic Club, like with all the support that was there and encouraging the kids um, to try so many different events because you necessarily, mm-hmm. when you come to athletic, everyone thinks you're only going to be a sprinter or you're going to be long distance. So like try so many different events and it's never too old. Like I didn't move to 400 until I was like 22, 20, 23. So like you are never too old to try anything, no matter what age you are. So like, um, just do it for you and just don't be influenced by other people all the time and what they have to say. Um, and that goes across all ages. In relation to the body image piece, I know Molly has spoken about this a little bit before and you're touching on kind of the attire. What is your advice for, say, someone that's like 11 or 12 years old and they feel a bit like uncomfortable about it? Um, like, how do you kind of get through that? Because I think sometimes when you get through to maybe like 20s or 30s, people can become a little bit more comfortable. But getting through those teenage years, especially because there can be a lot of kind of body changes going on as well. A hundred percent. And just say to you, like people around you, whether it's your parents, whether it's like brother like maybe sister um or your friends and just make it known like don't keep it in yourself and like there were certainly times where I would have been body conscious and I would have worn like a singlet instead of a crop top and um sometimes it's just hard to like be in like when you're obviously older as well like in that tip top shape all the time and people are conscious in this but like just wear whatever is comfortable for you don't be focused like I see athletes even on the European stage and one athlete is absolutely ripped and they have like a six pack and every muscle is, is showing, but that doesn't mean they're the, the quickest Gosh. or the best person. Like, and yeah. you look at them and you think, oh, they're going to absolutely storm this now and they're going to be 100% mm-hmm. unreal. And that isn't always the case. And like genetics have a big part to play as well. Obviously some people have, are more defined than others, but it is um, like... A sensitive topic um but just make it known to people around you how you feel and they're there to support you and whether it's wearing a singlet nobody cares like just like wear whatever makes you comfortable and i definitely think even like you look at the ncaa's no athlete does allowed to wear a crop top like everyone has to wear a full-on singlet and maybe that should be i think that is more common um across sports like athletics maybe mm-hmm. in ireland or across um europe as well it's interesting, actually. I didn't know that, and it it kind of brings a um, standardization into it that then takes it because I I know like in other things like there's been kind of talk about like um, periods and the fact that um, in say GAA and soccer and everything there's a lot of shorts are white. And I know uh, one club made a simple decision of changing their uh, football shorts to be black, and the comfort that that brought so many people. And it's such a simple change and it can make a massive difference to people and like people don't have that worry so like people just need to be comfortable in what they are doing and like again don't have to fall into that like norm of I have to do what everybody else is doing mm-hmm. just do what makes you comfortable and like it could mean like you go out there and give a better performance so like 100% be happy in you stepping out there and don't feel that oh I look different or I look um different to someone else but you just like be comfortable in what you're in your skin going out and wearing what you're comfortable in yeah, like kind of going back to you, I suppose, just for a second and, and Tokyo kind of 2021, um, like what are your, um, you know, like hopes, dreams and ambitions kind of for like, have you like a new appetite given how, you know, the successful the European indoors kind of were for you? Was 400 metres always kind of on your radar for Tokyo? Like what are your kind of thought process now? A hundred percent. It definitely gives me that hunger because in the, the day I was fourth and I wasn't in the medals, even though I did produce that massive um PB as well but for me I did fall that one bit short so like it definitely gives me it gives me the confidence knowing that I have arrived on that level and that I can take it on um further and I can compete with all these uh world-class girls and not just like be rated by them as well not just me like oh there's Simki Bowl there's Lika Claver they actually know who I am now too do you know yeah um and it just, yeah, it just gives me that confidence knowing that I can take it on further um, because I'm a big believer of, like, I need to do it to believe it myself. Like, I did have all the signs in training, but I need to go out there and do it in a race. And I was very lucky to kick the season off with a PB. Um, but for me, going into the summer ahead, I am qualified in 200 for Tokyo at the moment. So that'll be the the primary focus. Um, the 400 was always... In the back of myself and Shane's mind for qualifying, but we didn't know if it was going to take too much away from 
distraction of trying to make sure that I'm 100% focused on the on the 200 and that qualification is secure but the weekend set me up um, really well in terms of bonus points and ranking points mm-hmm. um, and I just need three quality 400 outdoor races but if it comes it comes and if it doesn't it doesn't but um, when you're in the opportunity to qualify for two events why not go at it um, yeah. like as well what is your favorite event race now that you have like such range over the 100, the 200 and the 400? So it definitely is the 200. Like it's just that middle ground, especially 200 indoors. Um, and if I had to rank them, it would probably be like 200 indoors and 400 indoors and 100. Um, but yeah, each bring their own element. And it's great as well to like have all the events to switch your focus because like mm-hmm. instead of repeating the same thing week after week and just if the performance isn't going the way you want it, um, just being consumed with that, where it is great to just jump into a different event sometimes and uh, everything is different. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely, it's it's cool to be able to mix it up, but um, we're certainly looking forward to the, the racing that's coming up in the next couple of months and wishing you all the best um, as, as we head towards Tokyo. In relation, obviously, we were talking a bit about shows beforehand. What um, what kind of shows would you recommend from a sporting perspective? Or do you do you watch other kind of sports documentaries or anything like that? Yeah, so I'm definitely, like, my concentration level now when it comes to Netflix sometimes is absolutely shocking. So um, <laughs> in the house, like... With my housemates, we always watch something. So at the moment, we're watching Behind Her Eyes. Um, but yeah, it could be a mix of anything. Um, like it necessarily always isn't in sport. I was delighted the other day to see Selling Sunset is going to be renewed for another two seasons. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, one that I did enjoy binge watching the last lockdown. But yeah, it's a mix of anything for me. Um, but episodes can't be like too long or that's me completely, completely <laughs> gone. <laughs> Selling Sunset's a good option though like I mean fair play because not anyone would kind of stand out there and openly admit they watch the cheese that is Selling Sunset so yeah. <laughs> thank god you're in my boat there <laughs> oh Selling Sunset and then keep you up with the Kardashians that, that's me sort of oh it's class like I'm Devo I'm Devo as the final season like coming up next month like I actually don't know what to do in my life like you'll obviously be training so I'm the sad here in this one no <laughs> no I do love a bit of cheesy TV yeah, and it's it's good to be able to switch off sometimes and just like you're saying the lack of lack of concentration sometimes short episodes so you can just keep moving on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's everything for me today. Anyways, I uh, feel it was brilliant to chat. Unless Joanne has any any more questions. No, I definitely like I've learned so much, um, and I'm yeah. eternally glad I have someone else in the reality TV bandwagon with me. Yeah. I, know, I know, like I work with, um, like I work with Ailish sometimes. Ailish McSweeney and Pep Talk, and she's the same. Like she's as much of a devil for it as as the rest of us. So uh, I think we all need to start like a union or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no thanks a million for taking the time it was great i think uh, people will get a lot out of the out of the chat and yeah we're looking forward to to the upcoming few months anyways and thanks a million for having me on best of luck thank you